19, and we are looking at the second half of it. Last week, we looked at Christ coming as the groom for his bride and the wedding supper. This week, it's a different supper you don't want to be invited to. And we're going to look at verses 11 through t- till the end of the chapter, the coming of Christ as king. This is the word of God. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he may rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Tough passage. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and our time this morning. Let's pray. Keith Green song, some of you know that. I can't get through that song without weeping. Thanks, kids. Ah. Today we're going to look at Christ returning as king. And uh, people have wondered before, you know, why, why does he need to return Too many times when we share the gospel with others, it seems that uh, the end of our uh, time is seated with Christ in the heavenlies in a disembodied spirit. That's not what the Bible says. Uh, You take a look at Acts, you'll see how many times that the gospel is given, and when people start walking out, you know typically the time it is? It's when they start talking about the resurrection. The idea is that one day God is going to resurrect our bodies and heaven is not the end of the game for us. Heaven and earth come together and we will run one day reign upon the earth because our older brother Christ reigns. Um, it's true. And so Christ has got to return. And it's not simply about us. It's that old song, Christ loves people more than anything. That's not true. <laughs> Praise the Lord, that's not true. Um, What does he love most? You know what the Bible actually tells you? Psalm 138, verse 2. He says, You have exalted above all things your name and your word. You see, Christ has to come back because he has to fulfill God's word. That's what he puts above all things, his name, his word. And we get to be the beneficiaries of that. Three things in particular that he will do when he comes back is he will judge the wicked world. All the wickedness, he will judge it. And he will uh, judge the living and the dead. And then we'll see, number two, he comes back because the world must be remade. He's remaking it for a kingdom upon the earth um, that will occur in the future. uh, On the earth, as we say. And number three, redemption of Christ's sheep must be made complete. This is so valuable, so important Uh, You see, God put body and soul together in Eden, right? And he called it very good. This is the way he's always meant it to be. Ladies and gentlemen, we were never meant to be, at the end of time, disembodied spirits. God actually doesn't think that's very good. 
So we see that Christ on the cross, he didn't come just to purchase your soul. He came to purchase everything about you, soul and body. And so that we now, if we are in Christ, we've got a new soul, but we don't have a new body yet. All you have to do is look down. It ain't there. We'll see that one day it will come, though. And the Bible actually even calls that salvation. Hebrews 9.28 puts it like this. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So when people ask you the question, when were you saved? As a believer, that's a hard question to answer. Because you say, well, I, before the beginning of time, I was chosen, right? Uh, not only that, but I was, my sins were paid for at the cross. Are you wondering when I was justified before God's sight? Okay, well, that's when I came to trust in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. But I know also the Bible is also, God is sanctifying me in this life. He's saving me. And then one day I will go to heaven where I will be saved. And yet, even then, the Bible still produces this term, Hebrews 9, 28, that he will save us, our bodies. So that's a very hard question. But ultimately, we know most of the time what they mean is, when were you justified before God's sight and your salvation secure? But we're going to see that Christ has got to come back to keep his word. And with that, we're the beneficiaries of this. I love what Dan Duncan said on this. Maybe you know him. It says this, it's the completion of our Lord's work on the cross, which, by the way, very thankful that Dan allowed me to teach and the elders allowed me to teach the last two Sundays here. Uh, it's the completion of our Lord's work on the cross. There, Christ won the victory over sin and death and the devil. In the second coming, he'll execute that victory over evil and sweep it away. You see, at the cross, he obtained us and he obtained the kingdom. And in his second coming, he will establish that kingdom and us too. Couldn't say it any better. So let's go ahead and dig into the text, can we? Chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and Righteousness. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. We'll stop right there. Can you imagine just the first four words, five words, and I saw heaven opened. What's that going to be like? What in the world is that going to be like? Well, the Bible tells you in other passages of Scripture, Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. 2 Thessalonians 1, The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he comes to be glorified in his saints. That's us. And on that day, to be marveled at among all who have believed. So it's going to be a joy to the world kind of day for believers, but not for unbelievers. And behold, what is he riding? It's a white horse whenever... People are wearing white in Scripture. It's a symbol of victory or righteousness. Probably means both here. So we know when Jesus first comes into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, he's riding a colt that was prescribed, prophesied in Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says he's coming humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's very specific. At his second coming, he's not, he's not riding any colt of a donkey anymore. He's riding a horse. And there was a reason why, by the way, that Jesus came in riding on a foal of a donkey. Uh, not simply because Scripture says it, although that's enough, but because back at that time, if, you're, if people are calling you king and you're on a horse, you're basically riding a tank. Uh, because at that time period, the ancients looked at the horse, especially a, one of this nature, a white horse, as being powerful and kingly. And uh, you're coming in as a conqueror. And that's why there are some uh, conservative commentators that would say this is really, there's so much symbolism in Revelation 19 as well as the rest of the book that Jesus may not be coming on a, a white horse as much as he is coming in righteousness and godliness and victory. Maybe they're right. Uh, here we have the first, though, of four titles in the next six verses. One of these titles we don't know. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But this first one, he's called faithful and true. Very similar Greek words. They mean ultimately the same thing, that Jesus 
Christ is trustworthy, i.e., he keeps his word, right? He keeps his word to his Father. It says in John 17, 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. He did everything exactly as his Father told him to do it. But aren't you glad he's not only faithful to his Father, he's faithful to his people, Right? Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Some of us have been, um, have dealt with cancer in here, even at this particular time period. Uh, some of us have had really dark days uh, with health or just life. And you know the story, don't you? The many times that people have come to me and said, you know, I know Christ is always with me, but during those times, he was with me in a really profound way. I can't really explain it. I know that the brothers and sisters that are overseas in prisons, they have said the same thing. When you read their books, Christ is with me. He doesn't leave me. He's always with me. So not only is he trustworthy, but notice this. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. Everything he does is righteous. You know, there's certain things that Christ cannot do. Cannot lie. Cannot tempt you to evil. He cannot sin. Everything he does is righteous. Deuteronomy 32, 4, it says, All his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. So wouldn't wouldn't that be a tough time if you appeared before a judge and you realized that this judge's name had just been in the news of all these sins that he had committed. He was going to be convicted, but not yet. He's going to be your judge first. You'd be thinking, oh, what a bad day. Jesus Christ is righteous, the perfect judge. He can't misjudge you. He does all things rightly. And notice this, John 5, 22, God the Father has given all judgment to the Son, all of it to the Son. Verse 12, and his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. So when we see aims like flame of fire, you might think anger towards sin penetrating judgment that God sees all things. And so the Son sees all things, of course. But note this, on his head are many diadems. The diadem was seen as a golden throne, a rather crown. It's a sign of royalty. And notice this, Jesus Christ has many of them. And the picture of is this, is that he's just not king of the Jews. He's king of all you Gentiles, too. Whether you submit to him or not, he will be your king. Uh, If you are in Christ, you will worship him. Uh, If you are not in Christ, you will still bow before him. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you can't say one day, well, he's not going to be my king. He is your king presently. And he will one day be your king here on this earth, whether you want him to or not. He has a name written on him who no one knows except himself. This is the second title and we don't know it, right? Jeremiah 32, 29, it should remind you of Jacob when he's wrestling. I think he's wrestling with a pre-incarnate Christ. I think that's what you see. And he tells him, he calls out to him, says, please tell me your name. Uh, and he says, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Or to put it in another way, he looks at him and says, no. <laughs> Why do you ask my name? And then he blesses him. So the, the point of it is, is I really like the way Dan Duncan said it. He said, no one will ever know that name. It's an expression of his person. In the Bible, the name defined the person, and it spoke of the character, and that's what it is meant here. It speaks of his person. There is much more about the person of Jesus Christ that is unknowable and always will be. And some of you may be scratching your heads and say, wait a second. John 17, 3. What about that one? John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You have to know Jesus. Christ is your Savior. or You're not going to heaven. You have no righteousness before the Father. Well, I would put it like this. Because I'm in Christ, I know him. Not fully. Not, Not even to say that in any sense, fully. It's like saying, you know, I know the Gulf of Mexico. I've been to Galveston. Laugh at that. Galveston? So you know the Gulf of Mexico. 
Galveston is, is, a, is just a thimbleful, less, in the Gulf of Mexico. You think you know the creation? You don't know the creation. How can you know the creator? Well, Jesus Christ makes him known, right? But only this much, perhaps, of the eternality of knowing him in the future. I honestly think most of our time spent in heaven, we may not be saying hallelujah as much as, no way. <laughs> really? Wow. Verse 13 and 14. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. In Greek, it could be sprinkled or it might be covered in blood. Um, whose blood is this? Well, it's the blood of his enemies, I would say. And there's references to this in Isaiah 63. Note this picture of Jesus Christ. You may not like it at first, but it's true in the Bible, so we have to believe it. Uh, who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? Basra is the capital of Edom. Uh, the Edomites were seen as the sworn enemies of, of Israel or, and of God. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau who cared nothing of God. Uh, continuing on, why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? In his answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. That's your Savior. Are you comfortable with that? You need to be. Because the fact of the matter is, is that some of us, as we study God's wrath, I know it's difficult but we have to believe it because the Bible says it. But remember, it's not that it bothers you because you're somehow more merciful than God. You're not more merciful than God? Are you kidding? I like the way Mar uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it. He says, most people are not really merciful. They just don't care about righteousness. You see, that may be more your issue. Righteousness is not a big thing for you. And so you don't have any problem... Uh, throwing mercy to whoever or wherever. And God does throw out all sorts of mercy, but he's also righteous and he will judge evil. He has to. It's in his personhood. I like the way Luther says it. If the world had treated me the way it treated Christ, I would kick the vile thing to pieces. That's true. That's right. It's amazing the sort of mercy he had upon us, right? His name is called the Word of God. There's the third title. That's his name. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. We have seen Him, the glory of the Father who came in grace and truth. Wow, the Word of God. Notice this, the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white horses. What or who? Who are these people? They could be angels. Matthew 24, 31, it says that Christ will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So they will go out and gather his elect. My guess is the elect that are still surviving at the end of the tribulation. They're still living. Uh, and then we also have saints. It could, these could be the saints. And I think that's what we're speaking of here. Zechariah 14 talks about Christ returning with his holy ones, i.e. saints. Check out the clothing. Did you see their clothing? Clothed in fine linen. We talked about this last week. These are the deeds of the saints. So I think ultimately when Christ returns, there will be myriads upon myriads of angels, myriads upon myriads of saints, right? Uh, notice they're, in, they're riding white horses. Why are they riding white horses if in fact... They are literal horses. Well, we, we should remember we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. I've never been a co-heir of anything, I don't think, but this picture of is that everything that he has, we have. So we live because he lives. We rule because he rules, and we ride because he rides. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul tells the Corinthians, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And catch this. And you are Christ. And Christ is God's. 
The reason why everything in life will one day be yours, the kingdom, the earth, the heavens, is because your older brother, Jesus Christ, he's the heir of God and you are co-heirs with him. Verse 15 and 16 says this, And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's the fourth title. Before I go any further, I should note this. If you haven't been with us in the study of Revelation, the... uh, the battle of Armageddon is on, going on at this particular time period in Revelation 19. Uh, Armageddon, it comes from the Hebrew Har of Megiddo. It's right next to this massive plain called the Plain of Estrelon. It's green. It's in northern Israel. It's beautiful. Napoleon called it the perfect battlefield, and, uh, and it will be. And it was set aside uh, God for a battle one time that will take place. We'll talk more about it in just a moment, but that's the context of what's going on here. Christ is returning with angels and saints in the middle of a war. Um, note this, there's something coming from his mouth. I would take this as symbolic, but uh, it's actually the Greek word ramphia, and it means a long sword or javelin. It was typically worn on your right shoulder. You would grab it from the hilt and bring it out like this. And you would use it for warfare. I mean, if you're carrying one of these ramphias, people clear the street. How much more the Son of God having it with him. But note this, I think. It's coming out of his mouth. Remember, we're going to see is his mouth is the word of, he's the word of God speaking. And the word of God is going to destroy the wicked and he's going to save the righteous. I don't think he's doing it with a literal sword, but I think that's the symbolism here. Continuing on, he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. This comes straight out of Psalm 2. You may have never considered Psalm 2 a uh, prophetic psalm, but it is. And it's not simply referring to the unbeliever uh, kings and rulers of the earth going against God, but in particular, Armageddon as well. I'll read off some of it. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his holy one, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Notice this. He who sits in the heavens does what? He laughs. Ha. Huh. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. What is Zion? Every Jewish person knows this. Sadly, many Christians don't. Zion is Jerusalem. That's God's holy place that he will one day reign in his new Jerusalem. And finally, in verse 9 of chapter 2 of the Psalms, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall scatter them like earthenware. This all will take place at the end of times here. On his robe, he's got this name, and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of Kings is actually an ancient Persian title that they would use. It meant that we rule all these other kings. And uh, sadly, they were wrong in their designation because Jesus Christ is the only true King of Kings. He will rule every country. He will every, every, uh, some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, right? So he rules the nations, and he's the Lord of all lords. Continuing on, by the way, he will have it on his robe or on his thigh. That, mean, that could mean two places, or it might just mean have king of kings up here on his robe and then lord of lords on his thigh. Uh, that may be symbolic. I kind of don't think so. Verse 17 and 18, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. Revelation 19 has two great uh, mealtimes in it, okay? The first one we talked about last week was the wedding supper of the Lamb. That is the end game for those that walk the narrow road to life that leads only to Christ. It's a gift of God. Uh, It's by invitation. We see that in Revelation 19. It's by invitation. But note this, y'all. 
it's effectually called. You put those two words together and the idea is the calling that goes out is going to be affected by somebody else, not you. Uh, Romans 8 talks about this. Those whom he predestined, these he also called. These he, he called, these he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. It's done deal. Your salvation is so secure. It's written in the past tense. Ha! It's great. So the picture what we have here is the wedding supper of the Lamb. You were invited and you came because God brought you into the kingdom. The next supper you don't want to be invited to. Note here, it's the broad road to destruction. It's by invitation only. Note, the invitation does not go out to unbelievers. It goes out to buzzards and California condors and bald eagles and golden eagles and harpy eagles and all these birds of prey that uh, this angel is calling out. Why is he calling them out? He's inviting them to the great supper of the God, or rather, great supper of God where they will eat the armies. Now, not certain exactly how this time period goes, but you can't help but wonder if the beast and his right-hand man, the false prophet, all the kings of the earth, all the rulers that are meeting in Israel, and they look up and they say, huh, all these birds, there must be something dead out there on the battlefield. And you go, yeah, it's, it's you, actually. It's you. Continuing on, verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Now earlier to, na- to take note is these armies gathered to attack Jerusalem, uh, perhaps to kill believers, uh, ethnic Jews that were, they were now trusting the Lord. It's hard to tell. Um, or they were being drawn to Israel to, to attack each other. But note what happens in verse 19. Now they turn their armies and they're going to go to war against this one coming in the clouds. You see, ultimately, I'll tell you this, their true problem is Jesus Christ. And I will tell you this today, as an, if you are an unbeliever today, your true problem is not with other believers. They're just representatives. They're younger sons and daughters of the king. Uh, your problem is with Jesus Christ. All right. The Bible makes this clear in John 15. Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, it would love you as its own. But you are not of the world, for I chose you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Let me tell you something. If you have not been rejected for the name of Jesus Christ, there is something wrong. Because the Bible makes it so exceptionally clear we're supposed to go out and make disciples. If you've never been rejected for that, why aren't you being rejected for it? Maybe you're not actually making disciples. This is the gift of God, that you should walk in them. It says Ephesians 2.10. I know, I know last summer I was rejected quite a bit by this one guy. I, had, I was actually out of Dallas Seminary, and um, he came up uh, asking for money. I, I don't give money uh, to those uh, people, typically. I may buy them food. Um, but I see it as an opportunity to witness sometimes, many times I don't. But you ought to take a chance sometime in doing it, right? I mean, Peter and John say, silver and gold have we none, but what we have we give to you. Might as well give them the gospel. Uh, Maybe buy them a sandwich too. But like I said, too many times I haven't. But this one time I had nothing to do, and I said, well, I tell you what, let me talk with you right quick. And so uh, I proceeded to to give him the gospel. I wanted to make sure that he understood that he was lost because of sin. Uh, Jesus Christ came to seek and save the lost, it says in Luke 19. But you need to first off realize that you're a sinner like me. And he stopped me right there. He goes, hey, I'm saved by Jesus. Uh, I'm going to heaven. I'm not a sinner. I said, well... Okay, let's kind of unpackage that for a moment. He said, I've never never done anything wrong. I said, okay, now we've got a problem. Uh, I said, you know, ultimately Jesus Christ came to save from sin. I'm telling you, I am a sinner. And the difference perhaps between you and me is my sins are washed away, gone from the east to the west. Yours are not. And rarely have I been shut down so quick. This man was mad. And I thought, you know, it's probably time for me to 
to walk away. But I said, you know, my encouragement is you, you should pick up the Bible. He goes, the Bible doesn't say it. I said, oh, the, the Bible is chock full of this information. You were a sinner, my friend, and so am I. And the only reason I'm telling you this is because without recognizing that you are a sinner, you will have no need of a Savior. By the way, isn't this what 1 Peter says? If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 Peter 4.4. 4. If you are not ever rejected for the name of Christ, there's something wrong. But note this. Ultimately, the problem is not with you. Be glad. The problem is with Jesus Christ, the one whom you saved. Jesus warns about this. So notice this. They're not just going against Jesus. They're also going against his army. Who, his, his army here. Well, like I said, in Matthew 24, the angels go out to gather his elect. What do believers, what do the saints do in this fight? Well, I get the idea that we sit in the saddle. That's all we do. And we watch the Lord save us the same way that he has always saved us. Right? It's all of grace. It's all his work. Verse 20 and 21. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled or gorged themselves with their flesh. If you want to know who are the first two human occupants of the lake of fire, I think you see them here. The Bible says in Matthew 25, 41, where Jesus will say, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Right? And yet we see ultimately that those who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior will not end up in Hades, but they will end up in the lake of fire. Right? So uh, these people that had uh, so misused their authority had so trampled upon the Lord in his uh, reputation, blasphemy, led the whole world in this. But note this, Christ isn't just holding these two responsible. He's holding you responsible today too if you don't come to the Son. And we see this here. It says, The rest were killed with a sword which came from the, from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's found in Joel, Zephaniah, Zechariah. Notice what Jesus does to destroy them. It's the sword that came from his mouth. Isaiah eleven four. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. I get the idea the same way that he made man and he breathed into him. The breath of life, he comes to life. In Genesis 1, 1, he says, let there be light. And there was light. Tommy Nelson in Denton Bible put it this way. At Armageddon, Jesus looks down and says, let there be death, and there was death. And by the way, if you're wondering what this looks like, I'll tell you. You don't need to watch it on the movies, although you will see it in person, perhaps. Zechariah 14, 12, it says, their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will rot in their mouth. A grotesque scene, but this is what happens for those that refuse to come to Christ at the time of Armageddon. Well, where is Satan in the mix of this? Well, we'll see him in the next chapter. You can read it on your own where he is bound. But real quickly, as Christ returns, where does he go exactly? It doesn't say that in Revelation 19, but it does say it in other passages. He actually appears to be on one of his favorite mountains, if not the most favorite, the Mount of Olives. It's east of the city of Jerusalem. It's only about 200 feet above the city of Jerusalem. So it's more like a hill, if you will. In Acts 1.11, it says, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into the, into the sky? What had just happened? Jesus had ascended to the Father, and the disciples, they're looking up. I can just barely see him, perhaps. And then all of a sudden, you've got two of these people right here that are not people. They're angels. And they're calling the apostles out, saying, What are you doing? <laughs> and he says, this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. There it is. You also have this Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah 14. Not only does he take his stand on the Mount of Olives, but something happens to the Mount of Olives. Do you know what it is? 
It says the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14.4 will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half to the south. You know what's interesting? You know what archaeologists have found? You'll never guess. Actually, it was an archaeologist as much as King Hussein of Jordan in 1964. He tried to build a hotel right on the Mount of Olives, but he had to relocate his hotel further south because wouldn't you know it, there's a fault line underneath the Mount of Olives. Now note this. Jesus doesn't need uh, fault lines that, he, that were placed before time created. He could move his big toe and the earth splits in two. Right? But it's interesting that he may very well use that same fault line laid down before time created. So I will close with this since we are out of time. Believers, let me give you a couple of points. And then if you have not yet come to Christ, let me talk to you as well. Believers, I'll give you a couple of verses. 2 Timothy 4.8. As Paul goes to his death, he writes, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but all to, also to all who have loved his appearing. Question, believer, are you loving his appearing today? If you are, then know that you are one of the chosen ones of the Father, purchased by the Son, drawn by the Spirit. Your role in justification, you ready for what, what it is? He was getting lost. Congratulations, you did very well. And so did I. We were lost. We are dead in our trans transgressions and sins. But the Lord raised us up, right? We were bought at the cross, and in His timing, He gave us faith, repentance. We believed. He's the only way to the Father. So you will live eternally, y'all, because you have the righteousness of Christ on you, in you. So love is appearing. And number two, 1 John 3, 2 and 3 says this, We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has made this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. What does that mean? You're pure and so you have to purify yourself? Well, you are pure in the eyes of God due to the Son's death and resurrection on your behalf. Yet you still have the flesh about you, which is this sort of evil residue of your former life. And the Lord needs to sanctify you, and He will do it. He's busy in the midst of purifying, taking all that stuff off. So now your role is simply love the Lord, serve Him, love the brethren, make disciples of all nations. Get after it. I agree with Dr. Johnson said when he regarding the second coming and saying it is the most practical truth in the Bible. You see, when we say, continuing on, come quickly, Lord Jesus, we cannot say that without saying within, I would like my life to be the kind of life in which I will not be ashamed at his coming. And as you know, both our Lord and the apostles warn us that that is a distinct possibility. It's possible for us to be ashamed when he comes. First John 2.28, speaking to believers, Now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. May the Lord give us grace for that, right? Uh, by the way, if you're an unbeliever today, I'll tell you this. Um, ultimately, you don't want God. You love His blessings. And as Augustine put it in the 4th century, you're a squatter. You know what a squatter is. He... He lives on somebody else's property, in somebody else's house, illegally, without pay, as if he owns it. And as if you are not yet come to Christ today, you're sitting on somebody else's land. You're on somebody else's property. Uh, not just the Lord Jesus Christ, but also his, his younger brothers and sisters, ultimately. Your role is to do nothing else but come to the Savior today. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.31, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.27, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. The only problem with that once is you don't know when that once happens. You don't know when you're going to die. Children die all the time. Come to Jesus today. I'd like for us to conclude with a song by Isaac Watts. You'll be surprised by this. It is a Christmas carol. But it's more than that. It's actually based on Psalm 98. It's 
Christ's judgment on the world and saving his people. Something that really doesn't come to fruition until the second coming of Christ. Not at least visually seen upon the earth. I want you to note as you're singing stanzas sec, uh, 2, 3, and 4, not at his first coming, it's at his second. Come on up and lead us in song, and I'll close this in benediction. Thanks, Warren. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen.